Hello, everyone, and welcome to the LabRoots Precision Medicine Virtual Event. My name is Guannan Wang, and I'm a senior research investigator here at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And I will be presenting today on bringing precision medicine to veterinary oncology. Please feel free to submit questions during my presentation, and I will follow up with you via email. So first, I'd like to thank Twist Bioscience to invite me here today to share my work and lab roots for coordinating. I'll share with you our effort at Penn to bring precision medicine to veterinary oncology. So here's my disclosure. On the menu today, um, at the beginning, I will um, show you the concept of precision medicine and how it is changing the landscape of a human oncology, although I don't think that's a, you know, a big issue for this audience. Then I'll share with you our study in canine hemangiosarcoma, applying the concept of a precision medicine and the NJS basic diagnostics to identify clinically actionable markers. Lastly, I'll talk about our effort to build a broad canine cancer panel designed to use in many types of common canine cancers. So I'd like to start today's um, talk with the story of a seven-year-old German Shepherd dog, Jacob. Jacob was the happiest dog in the world. One day, he just uh, he started to show lethargy and weakness before he completely collapsed a week after. Ultrasound revealed hemoabdomen and a large splenic mass, which was later diagnosed as hemangiosarcoma. Jacob underwent splenectomy right away to remove primary tumor, followed by chemotherapy to slow metastatic spread. However, despite that, the metastatic disease rapidly appears and he died three months after initial diagnosis. This is one of the sad stories of millions of dogs diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma and rapidly succumb to the disease. And very little can we do at this point to help them. So being a hardcore dog lover who have witnessed the rise of precision medicine and how it revolutionizes cancer care in human patients, as shown here by delivering the most effective treatment based on deep patient genotyping and phenotyping. So I, me and the, uh, my team at UPenn have the same goal to bring this concept into veterinary medicine. With the help of two great veterinary physician scientists at Penn Vet, we set to test the idea of precision medicine in the cancer that Jacob and so many other dogs suffered from, hemangiosarcoma. Canine hemangiosarcoma, short for HSA, is an aggressive malignant sarcoma, one of the most common cancers in dogs and almost 100% fatal. Most dogs die within six months of diagnosis due to metastatic spread to the lung. And it is overrepresented in German Shepherd Golden Retrievers and Labrador Retrievers. These features make HSA an excellent disease to pioneer precision medicine, such that there is a readily available tissue, desperate clinical need, and a potential human clinical correlate with human angiosarcoma as they are very similar histopathologically, but human angiosarcoma is just too rare to study. We hypothesize that if we assess tumor mutation profiles via next generation sequencing, we will identify oncogenic drivers and the clinical actionable targets, which will hopefully advance therapy and improve outcome for this desperate disease. To address our hypothesis. First, we performed whole exome sequencing to investigate mutation landscape of uh, K9 HSA 
and identified oncogenic drivers and biomarkers that have uh, potentially prognostic and therapeutic values. Next, I built a targeted resequencing panel to validate these biomarkers in a larger cohort. Also explore the research and the clinical utility of panel sequencing in veterinary medicine. Finally, we'll evaluate these markers in prospective studies, such as clinical trials. Our um, whole exon workflow is fairly straightforward, except that we have to use uh, canine exome capture solution instead of human, and we did sequence both tumor and the match normal tissue as a control. The annotation and interpretation of the results, however, is very challenging. Since canine cancer annotation is very limited at this point or not available at all. So we had to rely heavily on human data to predict and understand the function of the mutated gene, the pathways involved, and most important of all, the implication of mutations in cancer. Our customer canine breast uh, informatics pipeline you know, enable us to identify potential drivers and their biological and the clinical implications. Together, our exome sequence identifies identifying candidate driver genes in more than half the cases. Each column here represents an individual case. Case ID shown on top. Each row represents a candidate driver gene. Green squares here show um, the non-synonymous non mutations and the black squares are truncating mutations. Out of the four potential driver genes, two of them are oncogenes. P3CA and the PLC gamma 1, and two of them are tumor suppressor genes, P53 and P10. Several points I'd like, like, I like to emphasize here. Not only are the genes well established cancer genes, the mutations we identified here are also well documented oncogenic mutations um, as shown in human cancer, such as P3CA H1047R, which is the most uh, common uh, activating mutation in P3CA gene, and the P10 loss of function mutations and the PLC gamma 1 activating mutation. So we are very excited about these results. However, we can't ignore the fact that exome sequencing was unable to detect drivers in almost another half cases. Based on several lines of evidence, I hypothesize it's because exome sequencing is just not sensitive enough due to its limited coverage. So we decided to test a more sensitive strategy, targeted panel resequencing, which focuses on a limited number of genes that are involved in hemangiosarcoma tumor genesis. It, it's designed based on our own exome sequencing data and of course available genomic data on, um, on angiosarcoma in both species. It covers a full coding region of 24 genes and hotspot mutation in another seven, so total 31 genes. Including, these include oncogenic driver genes, recurrent mutated genes, um, and hotspot mutations that are indicated in both species. And a few also include a few common cancer genes in human and canine solid tumors just to wide the, widen the utility of this panel. And for methods, I chose to use uh, the Alumina um, Amplicon-based targeted resequencing solution. It's perfect for a panel this size and also compatible to use with the FFP samples because that's what we mostly get. So panel sequencing reproduced exome sequencing findings by re-identifying candidate driver genes in these four genes and in the original cases as well. But it also makes new discoveries. It identified detected potential driver genes in another eight tumors, as indicated by the triangles here. In these new cases, not only do we see the original cancer four cancer genes. I also found new recurrent 
unrest mutations in three cases. The allele frequency of the, of the recurrent unrest alterations is relatively low, which may explain why we missed it from exome sequencing data. So the re uh, recurrent unrest mutation we found here is a Q61 to R mutation. In human, this is a well-known activating mutation of NRAS and a, a driver in multiple cancer types, such as melanoma and lung cancer. NRAS is an attractive therapeutic target with drugs available to, tar to inhibit it. And NRAS is also um, found, the same mutation is also found in um, human angiosarcoma which is uh, an evidence that canine hemangiosarcoma have strong human correlate, could, could be a good model for human angiosarcoma. And Res Newton was missed by the discovery sequencing while detected by panel sequencing, highlighting the sensitivity of a targeted panel sequencing in this case. So next, we employed the HSA panel described above to um, sequence additional 30 HSA tumors. Results of all 50 cases are summarized here. I observed the same set of oncogenic driver genes previously described throughout all samples. As you can see, unrest is observed in 12 out of 50 cases, and 24 tumors bear PIX3C mutations The reason I put P10, PIX3CA and P10 together in the same box is because P10 and PIX3CA are both key components of PS3K pathway, and P10 inactivating mutation operates in parallel with PIX3CA activating mutation. Both leads to elevated PS3K signaling and present a very attractive therapeutic target for drug intervention. Out of the 50 cases we sequenced so far, I didn't find obvious drivers in four cases. And as you can see, six cases has only six cases have only P53 mutations, while no other major oncogenic drivers. This could reflect the presence of somatic aberrations not detectable by the sequencing method we employed, such as the you know, genomic large-scale rearrangement and copy number variations, or could be due to poor DNA quality in these samples, unable to make satisfying amplicon-based sequencing libraries. But overall, the panel is informative for 92% of patients, demonstrating high diagnostic utility. Noted that there is no overlapping between the major driver groups, suggesting that these drivers might represent distinct molecular subtypes of the HSA that were previously thought as a single entity disease, as shown here by this histology image. Several subtypes, several subtypes such as unrest, P53 and the PLC gamma 1, they are found identical. We found the identical mutations between canine hemangiosarcoma and human angiosarcoma, suggesting that although genetically heterogeneous, a subset of canine HSA share genetic similarities between human AS and could serve as a suitable model. On the other hand, PIX3CA, P10 mutant group, and unrest mutant group represent two great therapeutic targets suitable for pharmacological intervention, and they account for more than 70% of the HSA cases. There are both FDA-approved drugs and trial drugs available to inhibit these targets. The genomic data is a very compelling but the question remains, 
does the genotype correlate with phenotype? Whether upstream mutations actually lead to deregulated downstream signaling? To that end, we did immunohistochemistry on, these, on, on the same slide, on the same cases. As you can see here, the IHC staining show beautiful signal of phosphor ERK in NRAS mutant cases. Phosphor ERK is a classic marker of a MAP kinase pathway activation, indicating strong, strong association of NRAS mutation with MAP kinase signaling. Also, a direct evidence that NRAS mutant is driving hemangiosarcoma tumor genesis. Similarly, the activation of PIK3CA signaling is confirmed by the expression of phosphor AKT and phosphor S6, two downstream effectors of PI3K and mTOR pathway. The function study is particularly gratifying since it's consistent with previous findings that PI3K and MAP kinase pathway, pathways are frequently activated in canine hemangiosarcoma. And now our mutation data provide a genetic mechanism for these phenotypes. At the end of this process, we have in hand a validated functional relevant cost-effective NGS test, which allows us to rapidly screen archived cases for research purposes, but also have the potential to screen standard veterinary patient samples in routine clinical care. This panel allows us to begin to study aspects of canine hemangiosarcoma that were previously unthinkable. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll show you here how this panel our genomic findings have powered the design and the development of precision clinical trials, providing not one but two options. In one scenario, Phenotyping using HSC channel presents druggable targets. Based on the data I have so far, 50% of HSC cases with PIK3CA P10 mutations are eligible for PI3K inhibitor or mTOR inhibitor trial, and 25% patients harboring unrest mutant will be enrolled, can be enrolled in MAC inhibitor trial, and there are drugs available. As shown here, these are all the FDA-approved drugs. And, uh, but you know, finding affordable drugs is another story. Luckily, our work presents an alternative opportunity by taking advantage of the extremely constrained mutation, mutation landscape um, of HSA and the design the serial based um, the serial vector based new antigen immunotherapy trial. This study is currently underway in collaboration with uh, uh, Avaxis. And here, as a result of the mutation profiling, we were able to introduce the HSA specific mutations to the serial platform and to make an off the shelf vaccine product to, to treat HSA dogs that carry these mutations. And hopefully, the specialized vaccine will help train the immune system to recognize and kill cancer cells in a very targeted manner. In either scenario, it's reasonable to think that our genomic approach may lead to novel therapeutic options and transform how canine hemangiosarcoma is treated. This is just one example of the various advancements our genomic approach and HSA panel will make and a perfect segue to move into the last section of my talk. Here I wanna reemphasize the long-term goal of our collaborative effort is to bring precision medicine to the practice of veterinary oncology. Built on the rich experience gathered in hemangiosarcoma study, I have turned my effort to build a comprehensive canine cancer panel to enable the same kind of deep genotyping, phenotyping, and hopefully a clinical advancement for all canine cancers as we did hemangiosarcoma. Together, our broad cancer panel detects a wide range of mutations in 200, 284 genes 
known to drive cancer development. It covers a total target region of 1.4 megabases in canine genome. And this is almost 4% of the whole exome. And remember, these genes are all cancer related. For method, I chose to use the hybrid capture based enrichment sequencing solution. And this is down uh, by twist. The goal is to map mutation landscape identify drivers, biomarkers, to arm researchers and the veterinary clinicians with better prognostic information, targeted therapeutic options, and biomarkers to predict treatment response for common cancers in dogs. The, design, the, the broad canine cancer panel covers genes in key signaling pathways that know when to play a role in cancer development, such as the PI3K, notch, et cetera. And the design of the broader cancer panel is multifold. Not only is it targeting the cancer pathways, it also covers potential driver genes in top 10 common canine cancers, such as lymphoma, osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma. To the best of our knowledge, this is by far the largest and most comprehensive cancer gene sequencing panel in veterinary medicine. And we are very excited about it. With every opportunity comes with a decent amount of challenges. Here, I wanna show you a few lessons we've learned during this process. First, the design of the probes. Most design tools that are currently available are for a human. You would think um, it's an easy switch between human genome to canine genome. Turns out it actually requires twist to do some serious coding changes and the informatics resources. Eventually, twist had to basically rebuild the whole design pipeline for non-human species, including canine and the mouse. Now that they have it, Hopefully, future design for non-human species will be very straightforward. Just a heads up for, um, for those of you who are doing non-human genomics. Second, it's a common practice to add blocking reagent to the hybridization reactions to reduce, now the purpose is to reduce non-specific findings associated with the repetitive sequencing sequences in the genome to improve capture specificity and accuracy. Human cut one DNA is a, such a blocking reagent. It is enriched for repetitive non-coding elements commonly found in human genomic DNA. At first, we, were, we, we just assumed that we can use human cut one in our canine hybridization reactions assuming that it will do the same with canine samples, but our on-target rate really suffered. Before I did some digging and I realized that there is actually not sufficient sequencing homology between a human and a canine genome for that to work. So moving forward, canine-specific blockers are the way to go. This is a lesson for us and hopefully for other researchers as well. Currently, the design and the synthesis um, is all done, and the validation is underway. The matrix looks actually really good based on you know, initial testings with high uniformity and the low duplication rates. And we're just working out a few kinks to improve on target. I'm using hemangiosarcoma cohort as validation sample sets, of course, because the their mutation contents are well studied now at this point. I'm glad to find out that the new panel confirms previous results. You know, all the variants that I found that are supposed to be there are picked up by the new panel, such as P53, P10, P3CA. And we also make new um, detections such as for, for like the uh, potential drivers in samples that I didn't find anything before, or I found P53 
transmutation only. So, you know, why is that? I think combining with the pre-analytical factors for these samples, which mostly have really poor um, DNA quality to begin with, we think it's likely it like it 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 likely reflect the fact that hybridization approach is more tolerable for poor DNA quality than the amplicon approach. By far, between the um, discovery sequencing, the small focus panel, and the broad panel, I have almost 100% diagnostic utility for canine hemangiosarcoma. And this is the model I'd like to introduce to other canine cancers and hopefully other species as well. So in conclusion of our effort in pre bringing precision medicine to canine hemangiosarcoma, our genomic approach allowed us to identify driver mutations in most HSA cases tested, which leads to better understanding of the biology and the pathogenesis of canine hemangiosarcoma as well as human angiosarcoma. We demonstrate that canine hemangiosarcoma is consist of multiple molecular subtypes. Some subgroups bear similar driver mutations with human AS, suggesting strong human correlate. And the druggable molecular subtypes, on the other hand, help to guide precision clinical trial design and a rapid evaluation of novel therapy strategy and eventually tailored effective treatment. Our HSA project serves as a proof of concept study to enable precision medicine in other canine cancers. It already led to the development of the comprehensive cancer panel for canine. Our work here is not only valuable for veterinary patients, we may also be able to translate canine results for similar human diseases, particularly in the case of rare diseases that are difficult to study to mount a meaningful clinical trial, not to mention finding a targeted therapy. In the end, this is really a win-win situation for both people and our companion animals. So this is my, um, with that, um, so this is my funding sources, and uh, these are the people that are closely invo involved in, in this effort, and uh, special thanks to um, Dr. David Ross, uh, Nicola Mason, and Amy Jewell. But, um, you know, everyone can do this um, without them. And uh, with that, I'd like to close today's talk um, and by, by saying that I'm currently seeking, actively seeking collaborations and the tumor samples, feel free to reach out if you are interested in certain canine cancers or have access to tumor samples. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Precision Medicine virtual event. Uh, my name is Dwayne Hassani. I'm an assistant professor of computational biomedicine and medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine and uh, director of leukemia genomics for the uh, Englander Institute for Precision Medicine. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, clonal hematopoiesis and pre-leukemia. Please feel free to submit questions during my presentation, and I'll follow up with you by email. So a little bit of quick background. Uh, my lab works in the area of acute myeloid leukemia. It's a fatal disease with dismal outcomes. The uh, most pertinent fact for this presentation is the fact that it's a sudden onset disease. So people typically uh, present suddenly. I mean, there's sometimes individuals who progress from MDS to AML. Uh, but many people, it's a very devastating and sudden diagnosis. So they come in typically, uh, the physicians will refer to something as a Friday night leukemia. Uh, typically, it happens before weekends. We get our samples on a weekend. And it's because, you know, people feel that they are uh, under the weather uh, and uh, are seeking medical attention at the ER, uh, you know, to solidify their weekend plans. But what happens is, is what they thought may have been a cold or a flu uh, in time turns into a, a, a leukemia diagnosis. And unlike many cancers, it has to be addressed immediately. So there's really an unmet need for uh, identification of high-risk individuals who need to be monitored for uh, risk of AML. So can we identify in the population of healthy individuals 
those who are more likely to progress to AML, the disease that's actually relatively rare occurring you know, in a handful per 100,000 people, so depending on the age category, but we can consider it to occur in five to 100,000 people. AML, like uh, many cancers, uh, arises via the stepwise acquisition of mutations. So it is a disease of the hematopoietic system. And it begins, you know, with this pristine hematopoietic system that we're essentially uh, born with that acquires somatic mutations over time. Somatic mutations are generally not selected for, so most somatic mutations are neutral. Uh, so we're uh, pretty much uh, developing these mutations uh, even before birth. So they're there accumulating. Uh, but really with no selection pressure. But over time, there's this, um, this, this process of expansion that occurs via selective pressures or just random mutations that gain a clonal advantage. Uh, so this clonal expansion is termed clonal hematopoiesis. It's actually quite common in the general population. So if you look at, an in, at a population of individuals that are about 50 years of age or older, we find, and other studies find, that um, more recent studies find that 25% of individuals over 50 years of age exhibit some form of mutation in their blood. Typically, these mutations occur in very specific genes, which I'll get to, uh, but these genes also happen to be the genes that, are, uh, that pose risk for acute myeloid leukemia. So they're the early driver events of acute myeloid leukemia, but most people, the vast majority of people, are fine and don't get leukemia. So we're interested in actually understanding, you know, what it is that discerns a, a, a leukemia, uh, a gene that's likely, a mutation that's likely to progress to leukemia versus a uh, mutation that's not likely to progress to leukemia. These mutations accumulate. You develop leukemia stem cells, and then for further mutational complexity, uh, we develop a full-blown leukemia. Clonal hematopoiesis, um, occurs in genes that are associated with AML. So we can see here, and this is, uh, there's several reports. This is a more recent report from Nature Communications, um, looking at uh, the mutation spectrum uh, of people's healthy blood. So we can see most mutations occur in DNMP3A, TET2, B-Core, STAG2, ASXL1, KRAS is seen in some cases. These are the mutations that are important for uh, the early events in uh, AML, and they're just found in, in, in a very significant number of people. Uh, so they're, they're in healthy persons. Uh, what we need to do is discern what it is that differentiates, differentiates these mutations from uh, mutations that progress to leukemia. So the, uh, there were studies going back to 2014 and a little bit before that as well, but there were two major papers that came out in 2014 in the New England Journal of Medicine. One was by Joss Wall and colleagues. The other one was by Genovese and colleagues. And what they did was they looked at large uh, population uh, cohorts and looked at the risk of progression to any hematologic malignancy, not just AML, uh, and found essentially that um, even though the risk is obviously not absolute, uh, for progression to any hematologic malignancy, uh, this posed an 11 to 13-fold risk of eventual hematologic malignancy. So this is not just AML. It's AML, it's other myeloid neoplasms, uh, certain lymphomas and CLL, all of that included. Certain high-risk presentations of clonal hematopoiesis confer a 1% rate of progression to hematologic malignancy per year. So this is a risk that accumulates over time. And in that high-risk presentation, it, um, it actually roughly approximates the progression from MGUS to myeloma, uh, which is another precursor condition. So clonal hematopoiesis is a uh, condition that could be thought of as a precursor condition in very particular context. In addition, uh, clonal hematopoiesis confers an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. So for those individuals who are not progressing to cancer, Depending on the specific mutation pattern and specific uh, and the specific cardiovascular event, you're looking at a twofold risk, but uh, some some risks um, are tenfold or more uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease. So these clones are not inert even in the people who are not progressing to hematologic cancers. Uh, it turns out, and there's a body of literature demonstrating a wide variety of pro-inflammatory and prolonged inflammatory responses in these individuals favoring things like uh, the accumulation of macrophages and arterial walls. So this is a general and huge health concern um, that 
needs to be studied more carefully uh, to determine what the risk factors are for particular individuals. We've seen that clonal hematopoiesis is seen uh, concurrent with AML, and this is intuitively obvious. So if you look at the uh, slide I showed previously regarding the uh, progression from uh, normalcy to acute myeloid leukemia, there's a stepwise acquisition of mutations, and sometimes the precursors are still uh, dominant clones. So early in, this is uh, actually from a poster we presented back in 2012, what we did was we were looking to see what the mutation patterns uh, were in acute myeloid leukemia patients to identify, uh, you know, whether there were differences in the uh, compartments of an individual's disease. So what we could see is if you look at DNMT3A, which is one of the canonical um, clonal hematopoiesis mutations, the most common one, DNMT3A mutations were present in the bulk stem and lymphocyte compartments, so indicating that these were early events occurring in a stem cell. They were, and the mutations were propagated into the lymphoid and into the myeloid compartment. If we look at uh, NRAS uh, here, uh, NRAS was another mutation present in that individual's AML. Unlike uh, DNMT3A, uh, it was not present in the lymphocytes, looking at the panel on the right. So we can see that in the bulk AML and the AML stem cell fraction, which is phenotypically defined and sorted, um, we can see that the mutation uh, is occurring in the uh, myeloid malignancy, but the lymphoid compartment is completely pristine in this regard. So what we think is happening uh, in this model, which is consistent with what I showed previously, is that DNMT3A mutation acquisition is an early event. It is propagated into the lymphoid compartment, and then some fraction of lymphocytes will uh, demonstrate DNMT3A mutations. But once there's myeloid commitment, uh, NRAS mutations are acquired, and this leads to overt disease. So suggesting the utility of an early detection strategy, if we could actually determine what individuals with what particular mutations will progress to AML. So our lab became very interested in predicting um, AML. As I said before, it is an emergency condition, and, and more than half of presentations of AML are sudden with no prior warning. So no precursor condition, no MDS, no other hematologic abnormality. So we sought to determine if we could define a pre-leukemic state that is different from clonal hematopoiesis or identify at least what the various risks are with particular mutation patterns uh, in individuals with regard to that risk. So we looked at the impact of specific clonal mutations that were um, present in any heme malignancy. Uh, no study to date has evaluated serial samples at the point uh, that we initiated the study to look at the uh, clonokinetics. So the, um, the how these mutations uh, inform the timing from detection to present, excuse me, the presentation of disease. And our goal really was to, to there's, there's an acronym used in the field, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, which is meant to underscore the uncertain nature of what will happen with individuals with clonal hematopoiesis. And so we wanted to move more and more away from indeterminate. So to do this, uh, we could have done it prospectively, and it would have taken many, many years. Uh, but what we had access to was the Women's Health Initiative study. So we turned to blood samples that were banked going back to the early 90s, 1991, and were followed for uh, up to 20 years. So all of what I'm showing you is actually published in our Nature Medicine study, uh, which is shown here. It's the published main article. And there are various interesting perspectives articles that are accompanying news and views from um, Bob Seller, Sid Joswell, and Ben Ebert uh, in, the same edition, in the same issue, and various highlights articles that uh, give various different perspectives on, 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 on what our data actually mean. So I actually encourage anyone to read those. Our study design drew from the Women's Health Initiative cohort, which uh, comprised 161,808 women who were 50 to 79 years of age at baseline evaluation. And these women are uh, 50 years older and all postmenopausal. So that's one uh, aspect of one manner in which our, our, our population differs somewhat from a general population in the 50 to 79 year old group. It's all women, all postmenopausal. Uh, from this, we're able to identify 212 centrally adjudicated cases of AML. These are individuals with a confirmed AML diagnosis during WHI follow-up. 
and uh, 9.6 years was the medium time to diagnosis in the 188 cases that we could evaluate by next generation sequencing. Alongside that, we have age matched, obviously gender matched uh, controls. Uh, they were ma matched by age, uh, non-ANL cancer history, and 181 of those were valuable by NGS. From those, we actually have the largest serial sequencing study of clonal hematopoiesis with 132 individuals with follow-up at one year or three years, and 128 with serial samples um, at one year or three years. And to do this, we performed deep targeted sequencing using a targeted panel at a 2000X median depth of coverage, which we were calling events down to 1% variant allele fraction. There's uh, some controversy in the literature as to what comprises a right clone size, and I think what the field is looking for are more data-driven, more clinically-driven uh, approaches to defining what those cutoffs should be. In addition to that, because we used a large uh, in-solution capture panel, we were able to identify translocations, so we had actually uh, included intronic dates as well, as well as copy number events. So we, we got this very broad molecular portrait of uh, genes that are involved in both lymphoid and myeloid malignancies to look at what the uh, mutation state is like in healthy individuals at an average of 9.6 years at a median of 9.6 years prior to their diagnosis. So what's very important to remember is that these are healthy women at baseline. So if you look at um, the AML cases, so the AML cases are individuals who have developed AML. And you look at any, any particular parameter, you look at hematocrit, white blood count, hemoglobin, and platelets, there's really no difference between the control and the case group. So this is a case control design, and uh, these parameters are largely similar uh, between the two groups. So no, no real differences here. So these are people who are generally hematologically normal, uh, who wouldn't really trigger any red flags in terms of any hematologic parameter, yet they're harboring, in some cases, mutations. So what we did is we took this cohort and we deeply sequenced it using our uh, first panel. And uh, this is essentially what the mutation spectrum looks like. So um, on the left side, you can see the AML cases um, with the uh, red uh, title. That's 188 individuals and 181 matched controls. So you can see right away that the AML, the people who developed AML, so these are pre-AML cases, have more mutations in a more complex mutation spectrum. So not only do you see singleton mutations, but you see more co-mutations um, and just generally a, a higher proportion of individuals who are mutated. Um, notably absent, though, are FLIF3, ITD, and MPM1. So to an individual who's a trained, um, a trained leukemia expert, looking at this, it looks very much very similar to the um, mutation spectrum you would see if you looked at one of the classical AML papers, um, looking early on some work by uh, Tim Lay, um, going back several years now. Uh, if you look at the controls, you see the controls are mostly uh, pristine. So we have DNMT3A mutations in a significant number of the cohort, some TEP2 mutations, but really hardly anything else. Much, much simpler mutation pattern, um, many fewer individuals mutated. Uh, we also were able to detect um, some copy number uh, changes. So we saw you know, deletion 13, deletion 7Q, and some trisomies in a few individuals. So the pre-AML, to reiterate, was more complex. So if you actually looked at the same individuals, not were only were they mutated, but some of them had multiple mutations per gene. This was a feature that was not uh, as common in the, in the uh, benign clonal hematopoiesis group who did not develop AML. So if you look here, uh, for example, at uh, TET2, which is a nice and interesting example, uh, TET2 cases um, present in, in, in most cases, in many cases, and more than probably half of cases here, uh, are showing more than one mutation. Uh, so individuals who have more than one TET2 mutation are, are indicated by the non uh, red color uh, shown there. So some have two mutations, some have three mutations, and that's indicated in the number of variants key uh, down below. So there are definitely uh, people who have more t uh, t two mutations per individual, and this is a finding that was not seen in any individual in the pre AML co in the uh, in the control cohort. Um, which is actually an interesting finding because in in AML when it's diagnosed de novo. 
uh, individuals present typically with a single TET2 mutation. So, you know, theoretically, what this what this poses the possibility for is a uh, some driver process that's favoring multiple TET2 mutations, and one of those TET2 mutations goes on to progress to uh, AML, and the other TET2 mutation doesn't progress. So, I think if you were to actually deeply sequence um, AML individuals with TET2 mutations you might find a, a non-dominant subclone that is only TET2 mutated. This is something that needs to be uh, tested. But we, we thought that that was an interesting uh, way of discerning uh, the cases from the controls. Um, more importantly, we had a 30% rate of clonal hematopoiesis. Previous studies were talking about rates in the 5 to 10% range. So we did a lot of things differently uh, than, than were done previously, and this is uh, basically due to uh, technical limitations of the previous studies. They had exome sequencing data. They used the exome sequencing data they had to do a great study. Uh, but these were done on uh, Agilent, and uh, there were some uh, issues with Agilent whole exome sequencing, especially around TET2. So what I'm doing is uh, showing you an IgV uh, image. Uh, the top track is showing uh, an, a representative example of a uh, Agilent sure select all exome 2. And what we're showing here is the relatively poor coverage uh, that was, and this is actually acknowledged in the paper, so if you actually read the supplemental data in the uh, Joss Wall Genovese study, uh, this, this fact is alluded to uh, in, in, in each of the studies. Um, but if you look at the panel we developed, we're sequencing much, much deeper, and we're actually covering all the exons. So about um, half of the exons are actually being missed in TET2, and that's actually quite a substantial amount of exon space. So just from, you know, from exon coverage alone, we expected our TET2 mutation rate to be double, and then from depth of coverage, we expect it to be higher than that. Uh, so we think that our uh, rate of TET2 mutations is accurate, and that most studies previously, through no fault of their own, were just underpowered uh, just due to the available data that they had. So going back again, uh, the Just Wall Genovese studies in 2014 sequenced at 70 to 80x, there's a more recent paper that sequenced at about 500x. Uh, it was a Coons et al. cell stem cell paper looking at clonal hematopoiesis in solid tumors um, using the MSK impact panel. Um, but what we can see um, from a study in Nature Communications by Shin and colleagues where they were looking at um, how powered you need to be to detect mutations at certain variant allele fraction cutoffs. Um, to, to detect a, a 2% variant allele fraction cutoff, which is a working definition uh, for clonal hematopoiesis, you need at least 1,000x coverage. So you can see here at below 100x, you're really poorly, poorly powered to detect anything, you know, below, uh, you know, 10% 10, 10 uh, in this case. So you're hugely underpowered. You're missing, um, missing four out of five events occurring in the low VAT range. So it's a, it's a huge underestimation. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the conclusions of the, of the old studies are accurate, and our conclusions uh, seem to be uh, accurate and consistent. So this is just showing the various technical definitions uh, of clonal hematopoiesis, and depending on the allelic fraction cutoffs that are used and uh, the standardization approach and what is called pathogenic, you can see it can vary. So we can actually make it in line with previous studies if we use parameters that were used by previous studies showing our studies actually relatively consistent with, um, with with previous work. Overall, we had generally great coverage across the board, so we're showing on um, the major mutations associated with clonal hematopoiesis and leukemia, DNMT3A, TET2, P53, ASXL1, SRSF2, SF3D1, IDH2, JAK2, uh, great coverage in all the genes, very few low spots. Of the interesting mutation patterns we noticed was that uh, younger patients um, had a young, there, were, there was a younger age of onset for uh, mutations in DNMT3 and TET2 for the pre-ML cases versus controls. So if you look at TET2, for example, if you look in the under 65 group, 10% uh, were uh, mutated in TET2 at, under the age of 65 in individuals who got AML, but barely anyone, 2.6%, so essentially a five-fold increase uh, in the mutation rate uh, of uh, individuals who got uh, AML uh, when these mutations were detected in the under 65 group. So individuals progressing to AML uh, demonstrated mutations uh, at an earlier age than individuals who did not progress to AML. 
the risk is actually elevated by the particular mutation and the number of mutations. So the most risky mutation we found was P53, uh, followed by uh, double positive TET2. So actually, the double positive TET2 uh, mutations rival the risk that is present with P53, so both demonstrating more than 50-fold odds ratio. Single TET2 mutations were risky. Same pattern with DNMT3 and double DNMT3A. Uh, we could see the risk goes from 2 to 12.6 with two or more uh, DNMT3A mutations. Uh, mutations in one, uh, it's a crucial AML driver gene, IDH1 or IDH2, demonstrated a 30-fold risk. Uh, we saw some, um, some increase with JAK2 and, and increase with spliceosome, so spliceosome being SF3B1 mutations, SRSF2, and um, ZRSR2. We didn't see a pattern with ASXL1. So it's important when you come away from this slide to not think that if you detect P53 in an individual in a healthy population, that that means that they're going to get AML. So in our study, no individuals who uh, in, the, in the healthy group had a P53 or an IDH mutation. Uh, but there's really two important caveats to note there when you walk away from this. One is that P53 is a precursor to other conditions, CLL, for example. Um, and our study was a case control design. So what we did was we had this ascertainment bias in which we selected individuals who developed AML. Thus, if we were to proceed into a CLL study, we would also expect the P53 being a CLL driver mutation would also um, demonstrate uh, a risk. Not sure what the magnitude would be, but um, the general principle would be the same and that P53 would pose a higher risk. Theoretically, we haven't done the experiment yet. Um, and our sample size. So we're looking at 181 cases. It's possible that if we sequence thousands of cases, we might find P53 and IDH mutations that did not progress to AML. But nonetheless, the odds are significantly increased. So high-risk mutation patterns here seem to be P53 mutations, IDH mutations, and double TET2 mutations. So People with mutations, so if you imagine AML progressing from a stepwise acquisition of mutations, the more steps you've taken, the closer you are to getting AML, and that's exactly what we see with the data. So here we're looking at cumulative event analyses, uh, looking um, at individuals who have no mutation versus individuals who have a mutation. If you look at the panel on the left, you can see uh, these two curves, and uh, anybody with any mutation uh, developed AML at a sooner time than individuals who had no mutations and who developed AML. So looking at uh, 12 years in, uh, median time to diagnosis in individuals who presented with no mutation, that's accelerated to a number closer to seven in individuals who had any mutation whatsoever in their blood. If you look at the stepwise acquisition of mutations, the expectation is, is the more mutations you have, the faster you progress to AML, and that's exactly what you see. The individuals with no mutation uh, are still taking about 12 years to develop. One mutation uh, takes just a little bit under 10 years, uh, but we're moving closer now to six years uh, with individuals who have two or more mutations. So you can see that progressive shift downward uh, as individuals acquire more mutations. We also find that uh, greater clonal complexity and uh, clone size are related and consistent again with the intuition I was just presenting about oncogenesis. So individuals who have large clones that have become dominant with allelic fractions of over 10% demonstrate an increased risk relative to individuals who have uh, lower than 10% allelic fractions. The same holds true and even more true for uh, TET2. So uh, high risk TET2 over 10%, lower risk below 10%. Splicey zone uh, showed a trend toward this, but the trend was not uh, wildly significant. But you can still see that there's a difference. If you also look at the maximum clone size, so that would be the largest clone. So if you had a clone with 25% allelic fraction, just hypothetically, um, what we found was that the larger the clone size, the more co-mutations it had. So if you look at the ANL cases, you can see as the clone size increases on the y-axis, the number of co-mutations increases. In controls, this held true as well, uh, but not to the same extent, and nobody had five mutations uh, in the controls. So you can see, again, the, uh, the, the march toward AML is very evident, um, more so even if you look at the right panel. So we also, uh, as I said before, did 
probably the largest uh, serial sequencing study of uh, clonal hematopoiesis. So we're able to look at individuals at one year or three year. Here I'm showing you three year. And the plot's showing allelic fraction at baseline on the x-axis and allelic fraction uh, at uh, year three, I picked, um, on the y-axis. As you can see, uh, DNMT3A mutations largely to sit on the diagonal, meaning no change. Tattoo mutations, um, not very many are changed. Most are still sitting on the diagonal. P53 mutations, there's a bit of an increase. is much more of an increase of SRSF2 and IDH2. If you look at the mutation-specific risk using a statistical model, uh, accounting for co-mutations and looking at the independent risk of these posts, um, what we can see is that IDH mutations generally show uh, the, uh, a greater uh, clonal growth uh, per, per unit time independently of SRSF2, U2AF1. Uh, so these are all individual risks for these mutations, which is consistent with the plot shown on the left. We also saw different patterns of clonal evolution between baseline and diagnosis. So as individuals progressed to AML, the uh, subsequent clones got bigger um, and, and required more mutations. I'm showing you four cases here. Uh, these are explained in the manuscript in more detail if you look at them, but I think for the purposes of this discussion, we can look at case A. So case A, uh, is, a is a woman who presented a baseline with only an IDH uh, canonical mutation in the R140. I think it was an R140Q. And uh, this mutation was present at uh, just over 5% uh, allelic fraction at, at baseline. Um, as I said before, uh, driver events uh, for um, that, that, that promote the progression to leukemia. So uh, FLT3-ITD and MPM1 are, are hugely common events in, in AML. Those weren't present in the healthy group. But what we can see here is that she went in for her baseline evaluation, for, uh, for follow-up to her baseline evaluation at one year. When we look at that at one year, we can see that an MPM1 mutation popped up, uh, but this person was actually still considered healthy uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but it turned out 27 days later after that year one time point, the person developed an AML diagnosis. So this shows you that the early events leading to AML, such as in this case the IDH2 mutation, um, are present, but the progression to AML required the introduction of a cooperating mutation in MPM1. And once that mutation appeared, at some point between zero and one year, the progression to AML was very quick. Uh, so again, in under a month after this diagnosis. So all in all, I think our study uh, defined a number of high risk factors for AML, but we're still not at a position where we can look at an individual in the population and say, um, you are at an absolute risk or even have a 95% probability of AML. We're really far from that, but what we can do is uh, identify mutations that are uh, mutations that are higher risk. And what to do about those mutations is an open question. Uh, but what we do know is that the highest risk uh, is mutations in P53, IDH1, and IDH2. In our cohort, anybody who had those mutations uh, developed AML. It doesn't mean that in a larger population, so if we sample 10,000 people, close to 181, we might find uh, a, a false positive rate. Large clones, um, greater than 10% allelic fraction, demonstrated a significantly uh, increased risk. We found multiple tattoo mutations posed a risk that was very comparable to a P53 mutation, and we think that's interesting, something to pay more attention to. Spliceosome mutations co-occurring, especially with DNMP3, were risky. Anybody with uh, one or more mutation had uh, risk. And anybody with a fast uh, growing clone for P53 or IDH2. So, if the uh, P53 or IDH mutation were static over a period of three years, not changed, uh, those individuals were at much lower risk than individuals who um, showed an increase in, in clone size. Uh, and this is this is outlined uh, well in, in the actual paper. So we need to do better, obviously, because what, like I said before, we don't have the ability. To, um, to to look at these to to look at just mutations and say uh, you're uh, an individual that's going to proceed to AML. I think it's probably worth watching IDH1 and IDH2 individuals, um, but in, in in other cases it's, it's not entirely clear. So we're working at our center to really include many more parameters. So we want uh, medical data. So identifying 
uh, at-risk persons based on health abnormalities. Uh, so we're employing machine learning uh, approaches to see, you know, if you're a high normal white blood count versus a low normal white blood count plus a mutation, uh, how does that actually modify your risk? So incorporating uh, data outside of the mutation spectrum. Uh, looking at epigenetic, uh, epigenetic marks. So do epigenetic marks uh, provide added information on who progresses with AML or not? There's an interesting study uh, showing a higher rate of clonal hematopoiesis mutations, not peer reviewed, it's in bioarchive, uh, demonstrating that epigenetic age is associated with uh, the presence of clonal hematopoiesis. These mutations are, are in epigenetic modifier genes, so it's an actual, it's an interesting entanglement between the two processes. And then serum factors. So uh, clonal hematopoiesis uh, has been associated with the increase in uh, inflammatory factors. Uh, so there's population um, data actually showing this. So you know, do immunological and metabolic parameters uh, even help distinguish pre-AML from AML? So um, it's definitely important to get other parameters into this equation, medical history, epigenetic data, and, and further uh, in improving the risk stratification. Uh, because again, this is a very rare disease. So it's a disease occurring in um, you know a few in 100,000 people. So a false positive rate of 1% is actually very high in a rare disease that's occurring in you know uh, like I said, five in 100,000 people. We have a huge false positive rate. So this is something that needs to be refined. Um, in terms of why we would do it at population level, we think as the risk of um, the clonal hematopoiesis poses in cardiovascular disease becomes more and more established the probability of it uh, becoming incorporated in a standard of care workup for at least a subset of individuals might enable more uh, population level sequencing. So in summary, we should be thinking about the exposome. So we shouldn't be incorporating uh, baseline genetics, uh, childhood illnesses, um, history of pathogen exposure, which has been shown to influence the growth of um, blood cells harboring clonal hematopoiesis mutations and other such factors, uh, given that uh, clonal hematopoiesis uh, is a measure of, of molecular aging, which brings us to our molecular aging initiative uh, that we're conducting and initiating at the Englander Institute. So after all of this, what we decided was that what we needed was a cheaper test um, that we've actually termed precise one. We're looking at uh, genes that are associated with clonal hematopoiesis, genes associated with leukemia, and hereditary risk determinants, so things that are known to influence clonal hematopoiesis, DNA damage, et cetera, and sequence at high depth over a 500 KB capture space that was enabled by TWIST um, technology. So we're looking at a sensitivity target of 1% to 2% variant allele fraction. Uh, and in doing that, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, make sure that we are powered um, you know, at, at about 95% for uh, mutations occurring at 2% or greater, which seem to be uh, clinically significant. And this is a, a moving target again. So as there are more data in the field establishing what parameters are important for, uh, what cutoffs are clinically significant, uh, we expect this to be a moving target. Our data and data from a few other groups uh, show that allelic fractions of 1%, uh, as shown in our IDH2 mutations, for example, uh, in our study could be clinically significant as well. So, um, but as our, as, our, as our baseline, we're trying to get at least 2%, and uh, we've been sequencing, in many cases, to 2,000x to get that 1% number. So off the bat, you know, twi uh, we developed um, the, the platform with TWIST and got excellent coverage over the, the uh, exons that are coding for DNMT3A. So this is, again, showing the IGV view. And we can see here that there's uh, excellent uh, depth of coverage, and most exons are covered relatively uniformly. If we look at TET2, and we can compare this uh, going back to the previous slide I showed you on TET2. Um, most coding exons are well covered uh, for TET2. There's uh, some variation between exons, but um, the high point of this is, uh, I think, a few thousand X, and the low point of this is 500 X so in terms of what exons are covered. So. We have very good coverage for, for TET2 uh, on this particular uh, panel and precise one. And uh, ASXL1 did a great job as well. So the last two, we actually went with an approach as there are new resistance determinants and interesting uh, variants being identified all the time. We actually just did all the coding exons in our uh, precise one panel with twist, but the um, 
but the uh, last two exons, of, uh, especially the last exon of ASX, are one of those that are most important, and you can see uh, great coverage across the uh, coding region. So one thing we were particularly happy with was uh, coverage in GC-rich regions. So a particularly challenging gene, in, uh, an important gene in uh, AML diagnosis is um, CDP-alpha, so it's actually important for risk stratification of AML and has some applications in minimal residual disease. We're able to get nice uniform coverage, relatively speaking, um, across the entirety of the gene body. So in the middle of CBP alpha, there's a very GC rich tract that you, can see, uh, you can't see in this particular plot, but the very middle tends to be very poorly covered um, in, in many first runs. Um, so we, we actually had a, a relatively decent uh, outcome uh, in, 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 you know, in our first uh, interaction with uh, TWIST on this. Results will vary though. We find that uh, the GC rich region um, is a little bit sensitive to lab techniques. So we will see a little bit uh, sometimes better than this, sometimes worse than this, but uh, never a complete bald spot in, in the middle of CBP alpha. So this is actually a great result. It's also very clean. So you can see here at 1,180x coverage, we have no mutations down to 2% or more fraction. So we're essentially able to take the library prep protocols and um, that we're able to use in the nature medicine study make a few minor adaptations to um, facilitate the twist protocol uh, to do this. And uh, essentially, we're able to um, use the, the previous library capture uh, library prep protocol with the twist capture protocol and uh, get a, a good panel working off the bat. Another area where we were pleased was the excellent uniformity uh, we got with our precise one panel. So here's a random selection of 10 samples on the y-axis I'm showing you. Uh, millions of past filter reads and the fold 80 base penalty is shown on the x-axis. And you can see here for the 10 samples, uh, all of them had a, a 1.3 uh, fold 80 base penalty, which is, uh, I think, really great. And this was um, fold 80 base penalties, uh, the sequencing required for 80% of bases to achieve the coverage uh, median. So that was great. Going forward, uh, we're planning to deploy uh, the Precise One platform at our center to look at larger cohorts assessing clonal hematopoiesis. We need to perform more detailed QC analyses of our current platform, um, applying additional boosting of baits if needed. And we are also able to adapt and extend the panel to disease specific applications. So if we want it to be a lymphoma panel a little bit better than it is a leukemia panel, we can easily make those adaptations. And importantly, uh, even we use some of the libraries that we've already generated. So this is a huge study, uh, actually, and it was uh, made possible really by, by a large team. So I need to acknowledge the uh, first authors and lead authors, um, Mpinkle Desai and Miriam and Sia Trincha. Pinkle, uh, in our, uh, Dr. Desai interacted with the uh, Women's Health Initiative cohort, and Nuria uh, did much of the analysis and sequencing. Um, with support from a, a huge, huge team. Um, we have uh, funding was provided actually by Leukemia Fighters, for which we're thankful. Uh, some slides here were funded by Leukemia Lymphoma Society, uh, including uh, funding we got from our, from our own cancer center. And of course, we're eternally grateful to the Women's Health Initiative for uh, actually making this study possible. It would have taken many, many years to get to the point uh, that we did. So I'm going to uh, close with uh, my contact information and uh, the disclosure that uh, this, this uh, talk was uh, sponsored by uh, TWIST. Uh, if anybody has any questions, obviously you're free to contact me using the, um, the, the, uh, the interface, uh, or you can email me directly, and I'm also on Twitter. Uh, I'm happy to discuss any of the details uh, of the study or any technical parameters of our precise one test or any other question you may have. Thank you for listening.